Sarah Stricker, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure. You are my first, I believe, I hope I'm speaking correctly here, but you, I think you are my first TikToker. And I'm super stoked about that because I'm kind of a little hooked to TikTok right now. So yeah, welcome to it the program. It can be really addictive. I love TikTok too. Yeah, you are. Uh, your handle there is Science Sarah. Um, so science and then S A R A. You speak about all sorts of things, from being a grad student to um, some political issues that are near and dear to your heart, to uh, you know plant pathology and plant diseases and your love of all things plant. So I think that's really cool. Uh, I, I do want to talk about that first. I want to do a brief intro. You are a PhD candidate in the Department of Plant Agriculture at the University of Guelph here in Ontario, Canada, fellow Canadian. And um, I guess would it be accurate to say that you are a plant pathologist? Yep, that's the one. I like to call myself a plant doctor. It's like as you would go, if you were sick, you would go to see a human doctor. You take your animal, if they're sick, to an animal doctor. I take care of sick plants. So I am a plant doctor, or I will be once I finish my PhD degree. Which you were telling me uh, you're you're doing that in about two weeks. Was it two weeks that you said? Yeah, it's coming up. So I'm going to be having what's called a defense. So I have to give a presentation. It's public. People can come ask questions. And then it's like a public oral exam and it's pass or fail and so hopefully it goes very well and at the end of it then they say you know congratulations you are a doctor or try again I guess <laughs> actually that is one of my questions so what actually happens if um if you do get that kind of try again what does that mean do they give you like a second date for you to like reschedule yeah, they'll give you um, edits. Uh, so I've prepared what's called a thesis. It's a really long written document. Mine's about 200 pages. Um, and it just shows all of the work that I've done in the past four years. And then my defense, and then they ask me questions. And so if I don't answer those questions right, if I'm answering really, really wrong, that might be a problem. If there's something really, really wrong with my thesis, they might just send me away and say like, you need to go do this, or there might be an extra experiment I might need to do. And then I try again. If I fail the second time, then that's when things start to get a little bit hairy. But it's really in the best interest of my advisor. My advisors are Meredith McDonald and Bruce Gosen. Um, they're the people who kind of designed my project at the beginning and have helped me all through the way. It's in their best interest to make sure that I'm ready for this because they look bad if I don't do well, right? So I'm pretty confident that um, Dr. McDonald and Dr. Gosen have pre prepared me to do this. So I believe I'm going to pass, but there's always the chance, you know, I've got a wild card. There's a person, uh, um, we call them the external examiner. There's someone I've had no contact with whatsoever, and I don't know. They're the person I really need to impress, you know? So we'll see how that wow. goes. Wow, that's a little bit nerve-wracking. I It's funny because I dated a, a PhD candidate at one point in my life, and she was just a basket of nerves. So I can't even imagine what it must be like. Uh, are you nervous, or do you tend to perform really well under pressure? Oh my goodness, I get so nervous. I, I don't show it very well, but I'm actually a very anxious person on a daily basis. Like I get really talkative and my blood pressure goes up and my turn really red. And and sometimes I'll even like burst into tears if I've gotten too high emotion. It's it's like a thermometer just filling up and filling up until it explodes. <laughs> so yeah, I definitely do get nervous, but I'm also pretty confident in myself at this point. I've been studying this for four years. I know my my stuff. I'm going to do well. And also, I've already started a job. The, I've worked for one week as a new job. And so it kind of takes the pressure off. You know, I'm like, I already have a job. So... <laughs> Much pressure, you know. <laughs> of course, it takes the pressure off, but nonetheless, I'm sure that you're looking forward to to getting this over with and getting it done. Um, your new job is, of course, in science communication at also at, at the University of Guelph. That's really cool. Congratulations. Um, I want to talk really quickly about SciCom before we get into the plant stuff, um, because again, I want to bring up TikTok. 
it is to me a phenomenon. I have seen, I've learned so much off of TikTok. And here are these, you know, 30 second clips, 20 second clips sometimes. Um, and I'm learning about outer space. I'm learning about plants with you. I'm learning about, you know, other mi microscopic life. I myself have tried doing a, a few TikTok videos. I have to admit, as a creator, it's not my thing. This is more my thing, long, you know, long formats. Um, but I'm taking it all in. So I want to know what what made you decide to get on TikTok? Well, I first just was watching other people on TikTok and I thought, wow, that looks really fun. And I grew up in the age where YouTube was brand new and, and I always kind of wanted to do something on YouTube, but I didn't really have the time to do, you know, like set up, get the equipment and, and everything. But TikTok is so easy. You do it from your phone. You don't need anything. I mean, I got headphones, you know, Bluetooth headphones so that they connect with my, I get some better sound off that, but that was really the only investment. Maybe someday I will get a ring light. We'll see. Um, <laughs> but other than and that- They're super cheap anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, it, it's so easy. You just pick up your phone, you press one button and, and you've made a video in 30 seconds. It's And it's got- editing software built into the app. So it is really easy for someone with no training to get into like myself. Um, so I just started, you know, for funsies, I was just lip syncing to some songs that were stuck in my head, like as everyone does. And then I thought, you know what, I'm in the lab. Let me show you some cool things, you know, like, I made a joke once about, you know, how did I get where I where I am today? Oh, I graduated and I held up a graduated cylinder. <laughs> just, just silly, stupid <laughs> jokes, you know? So, and it, it kind of expanded from there, especially when I was teaching a class here at the university. I was teaching the plant pathology class and my students were really excited that I was on TikTok. So that kind of encouraged me at least once a week, I would make a quick little TikTok video, mostly for them, but then it, it's public. So I, I would show like a different disease or something I was doing in the lab. And, and it just was a different way to show them the content that they could consume in a very easy manner. You know, it's not like assigning a reading. It's not a 40 minute video. It's it's a 30 second, maximum 60 second video. And it could be silly. It could be just like, oh, wow. and Or get an idea in your head that you want to then Google something else. So I think it's really cool. And and yeah, I've also talked some other things about, you know, like the Every Child Matters, um, like the Orange Shirt Day, Pink Shirt Day, different um, events and try to raise the voices of other creators as well, if I can, um, because I've learned so much through TikTok about the Black Lives Matter movement, how to be an ally. I've learned things about neurodivergent things and was like, hey, maybe I'm ADHD. <laughs> You know, so I've learned so many things through TikTok and now Bill Nye is on TikTok too. So right. I feel, you know, now I'm on the same kind of platform as Bill Nye and I feel a bit more pressure to, to put some good quality out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's something I did want to talk about is the pressure, but also the vul vulnerability, because it takes a lot of vulnerability to put yourself out there to to mm -hmm. not just, you know, do science videos, but you do things that are uh, sometimes a little bit more personal. You know, it's kind of nice because we get to know you, like who is Sarah, but also, you know, you just told me that you're a super anxious person. So I'm wondering, how do you tackle the vulnerability of making t TikTok videos? Yeah, and there was one video that I had that blew up and it got a little bit out of hand. I got really worried about it. Um, so I am in the LGBTQ community and my partner and I were planning to get married uh, in April of 2020. And I tried on what would have been my wedding dress and I was really sad and I showed a video of me in my wedding dress and it's sort of um, a two piece Indian style dress with intricate gold beading, uh, things like that. I was very sad. I was just wearing it to be like, hey, this is what my wedding dress would have been like. And we canceled our wedding <laughs> and oh. that blew up. And it was not all nice comments. Some people were like, Oh, that sucks. That I'm really sorry to hear that. Other people were saying, 
oh, you're a white girl and you're um, appropriating our culture. Oh, this is the wrong color. Oh, this and this. And they all had opinions. I had, to, I considered taking that video down. I, I ended up having to turn off comments on it because it was blowing up on my phone. Every two seconds, I got another notification. Um, and that's where I was like, wow, I really have to be careful about what I put out there because there are people who have really strong opinions. Um, and so I, I held back on a bit. I do show a little bit of my own things, but I mean, I just, I, I now, I do have a little bit of a filter. I'm, I have to be cautious about what I put out there, but I also am proud to be a gay scientist. And I think it's important to have visibility, especially for our youth. Um, to be, you know, I'm a woman scientist, I'm a gay scientist, I'm a neurodivergent scientist, and you can be too. Uh, because when I was growing up, I didn't have any of those role models. My role model was Bill Nye, you know, a white cis male. But I met in high school a female who had a doctorate. It's the only person probably in my life before I came to university that was a female that was a scientist, that was a doctor, and she really drove my passion for science. And I'm eternally grateful if Dr. Denica, if you're talking, if you're listening to this, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Have you reached out to her? I actually did. I found her on Facebook um, a couple weeks ago, just to tell her, be like, hi, do you remember me from high school? I'm defending my doctorate and you're invited and thank you. <laughs> Nice. That's so sweet. Um, yeah, it's it, it is something um, to to be able to to create. You know, to to also produce what it is that you want to produce. It is your channel. It's not you know under the university scope and and things like that. Is most of your audience are they also other students and scientists, or are they just mostly the like the general public that's just all of a sudden discovered you and learning about plants and stuff? That's a good question. It's actually really hard to gauge metrics on TikTok because I have like 14,000 followers. So I don't go through and, you know, check them all. And the only information you can really get from them is, is a tiny little icon photo, which sometimes is them and sometimes not. It could be anything. It could be a picture of a monkey, you know. <laughs> um, and then sometimes people put a couple words in their bio, but that's also character limited. So I don't really know a lot about my audience. I would guess that I have the range. I know I have some TikTok friends that they message me on, on TikTok and they are also creators and they are old enough to be my parents. I also have some TikTok users who are young enough to be my child, you know? So there's the whole range. I do think that um, whenever I tag, you know, university, I get lots of university students. Um, and, and I hope that I raise people's awareness you know, if you're in an undergrad program, a four year bachelor of science program to think about grad school, because it is an option. I didn't know that this was an option when I was in undergrad. I did a four year bachelor of science. And then I went and did a teacher's college thing because I I knew I wanted to teach. I wasn't really sure how to get there. Um, so I did bachelor of science and a bachelor of education. And I tried I was teaching as a high school teacher. Um, and then I was like, I don't really like, it's not that I didn't like it. It was really, really difficult to teach what I wanted to teach because the curriculum is so structured and there's a, there's a lot going on in the, in the elementary school, high school system. I don't want to get into that. Um, so I came back into a, a graduate program. I came back and did my master's with a, a professor I had previously had a mentorship through with. I had kind of contacted him while I was teaching a high school class and I was like, wow, this is really tough and I'm not doing well. I don't know what to do. Do you have any recommendations? And he said, you know, come back, come back to my lab. You can start in January. We'll do your master's of science together. And through my master's of science, I got the opportunity to teach, you know, as a, a sessional lecturer, I taught a plant pathology course. I got to teach as uh, or assist teaching. So it was a TA, a teaching assistant. And that just kind of opened the door of like, whoa, like teaching in post-secondary level, this is fun. And then also getting to volunteer with a program called Let's Talk Science, which then gets you back into the classrooms of elementary to high school. And you do really fun little hands-on activities. I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to do trips and and be that like 
scientist in the classroom. And that's also why I like TikTok because then I'm like, I'm scientist in your cell phone. <laughs> it, yeah. And, and it, from the, the sounds of it, you really are a, a seasoned communicator. I mean, uh, you know, teaching from high school, doing this Let's Talk Science program, now TikTok. So I'm, I'm curious, what would you say to the scientists out there that are contemplating getting on TikTok? What advice would you give them? Oh, do it, do it, do it. You're going to suck at first and that's okay, but that's how you learn, you know? Um, yeah, I think a big thing that scientists struggle with is that we're often too focused on the details. And sometimes you have to simplify things and that means you get rid of some details. I've been to so many talks at conferences or even in lectures where there's graphs and pictures and, and tiny little text and this and this, and it's just, it's too much. You have to zoom out a bit and you have to make it interesting and also convey your passion. Like, yes, you could really, really like fractals. Like maybe that's what you're really, really excited about. But if you talk like this and <laughs> it's so boring, true. everyone's yeah. going to turn off. No one cares. So infuse yourself with the excitement of seeing it for the first time, you know, because it might be someone seeing it for the first time, especially on TikTok. You never know what the algorithm is going to send you. And like you go from one TikTok and it's one video and it's like a, a dog dancing. And then you go over here and, and someone's telling you something about politics and then something over here. And it's a comedian and over here, an artist making beautiful earrings. Like it's the topics change every 60 seconds so you have to be able to make something interesting for someone like in the in the first 10 seconds otwise you're gone you're gone in a swipe yeah it's and a lot of pressure see you again <laughs> <laughs> and and I think what I like to, to to say to people also is you know pick the thing that works well well for you so if you're somebody who likes to create quick content or whatever great if you're somebody who likes to write write a blog you know, mm. there are people who I think have certain skills that are better for suited for their personality types, I think, you know, instead of trying yeah. to, to do the cool thing all the time, you know, I don't know. That's my for personal sure. opinion. <laughs> and um, you can sorry, go ahead. also make partnerships with other people who are good at those things, you know, like a friend of mine is really interested in, um, in, in reaching out in the French community because they just recently moved to Quebec and, and she's really worried because she's not very fluent in French. And I was like, well, that, that's where you make a partnership. And then you find someone else who has strengths who can work with yours. Like maybe you have the knowledge and they have the language, or maybe you have the information and someone else has animation skills or something, you know, like find a partner. That is huge. That is huge. And I think it's not said enough is collaboration, you know, um, for, for online content, for anything, just to, to get the word out about anything. Collaboration is, is gigantic. So I'm glad that you, you brought this up. Um, Sarah, you also mentioned, you know, talk with excitement about your passion. So let's do that right now. Let's talk about um, plant pathology. Uh, okay, so plant diseases is is your passion essentially plant diseases plant fungus plant insects <laughs> eating the plants and all that stuff um yep. where do we start here i guess your research let's start with your research i know that you're researching something something about onions yes yeah so my, <laughs> you want my, you want to give me the 30 second talk on that <laughs> sure so I've been studying uh, a fungus that infects the leaves of onions. And you don't really think about how onions grow because you eat the root of it. So you don't really think about the plant itself. But when it grows from seed, it first grows some very big onion leaves. They actually kind of remind me of giant aloe plants. And I'm talking giant to be like two foot tall. You know, they're big. But you can imagine if you don't have leaves, you can't grow roots because plants get all of their energy from the sunlight, right? So they need to have leaves to grow roots and we wanna eat the root of an onion, right? So this is a fungus, it attacks the leaves of onions and can lead to smaller onions. So farmers in Ontario are really worried about this one specifically because it's become more and more noticeable in the last 10 years and we're wondering why. So I looked at all of the factors that could affect the life cycle of this fungus. So it 
you know, where does it survive the winter? How is it reacting pro uh, as we would expect to the chemicals that we are applying? Um, are there other plants that it might be infecting or hiding in? And, and looked at all of these different aspects to try to see if we can find better management tactics. And I also have a sort of an environmental scope, you know, a chip on my shoulder always to try to make things better for the future. And I looked at, you know, what weather patterns result in more fungus in the air, like, cause it, re it releases spores that go in the air. So I, if we can predict what kind of weather results in fungal spores, then we can only apply our chemicals when we need to, right? So then that can reduce the, the farmer's cost, it reduces cost to the, the consumer as well. But then my big thing is that it reduces sprays and less chemicals in the environment. So it's a win for everyone. Is that the solution? Is it chemicals? Is that what um, kind of fixes the problem, I guess? Yeah, well, and that was also another part of my project. And I found that the four, well, two of the main products that we're currently using, they don't actually work. Uh, the fungus is is resistant to it or, or insensitive to those chemicals. They're not working as, as they should. And so I recommended to the farmers that we actually stop using them. And there's a possibility that if we stop using them after a few years, um, we might kind of weed out the resistant individuals and then the chemicals might work again in the future and i think that's kind of why this disease has become more and more prevalent it's because our chemicals have become less and less effective it's not that the disease got worse it's just that our chemicals don't work anymore it is this like bacteria like um you know uh, antibiotic antibiotic resistance is this the same thing that's happening yeah, it's the same kind of thing. So fungi, bacteria, they're both microscopic organisms. Bacteria differ from fungi a bit because they're individuals. One cell is one individual. But fun fungi, one cell could be one individual or an individual could be made of multiple cells. Does that make sense? Interesting, um, yeah. Yeah, so bacterial resistance and, and um, antimicrobial resistance, it results from like, a rare mutation. So it could just be like, oh, this one individual in 10 million bacteria is resistant to the antibiotic. But if you then apply your antibiotic and you kill off 10 million bacteria and you have one left, who's left to reproduce? The next generation is going to have that mutation. And that's what happens, you know, um, over multiple, multiple re um, applications of the same antibiotic, or in this case, fungicide we actually increase the number of individuals in the populations that are resistant. Did you see my mind being blown right there? Because my mind I, was blown. There was a moment. <laughs> yeah, there was a moment. We're on video right now. You guys uh, aren't, aren't able to see us, but we are on video. So we're able to, to see each other's body language. And there was a moment there when you said, you know, that one resistant bacteria will survive. Uh, so how the heck did you fall on, on this particular topic. I have found with scientists that usually they do their PhD on something that's personal or something that's accidental. And so I'm curious to know how you, how you decided that, you know, this fungus that was killing onions was your thing. Well, so I did my master's with a previous, my, my mentor, who was Dr. Tom Shung. So I worked on turf grass. So it's a, it's a golf course grass. And I was working with a different fungus called Microdochium navali, and we were looking at, you know, oh, what, it, what will climate change, how will climate change affect this disease it's called Microdochium patch? And we also looked at uh, a product that was developed actually by um, PetroCanada, uh, like the gas company. Right. <laughs> they they, they kind of accidentally made a product that works, that you can apply to plants to protect from fungus. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's a mineral oil product. Um, so I was looking at using that to control this disease. Um, and so the link between my master's project and my PhD project was that mineral oil product. Um, I used it for my master's. And then I heard through the grapevine that 
Dr. Mary Ruth McDonald was interested in trying that product on onions. And I was like, all right, sure. So I kind of followed the product into the onion field. I did try it on onions. It didn't work. And it's also way too expensive to be applying. It's like over a hundred times more expensive than a fungicide. So it's not going to work, unfortunately, but that's how I got the connection. Um, and why this disease on this crop, that kind of got directed by the growers. Um, we actually at the, the research station is called the Muck Crops Research Station. Um, it's called Muck Crops because it's any crop that grows on muck soil. It's a very marshy, it was a marsh that was drained. So it's very moist, very organic matter uh, content. It's almost not even dirt. It's just like compost almost. <laughs> it's great. So anyways, it's the Muck Crops Research Station. And they have a really good relationship th with the growers nearby. They have a growers association and the growers will come to the research station and say, I see a problem with this. My neighbor also sees it. This guy sees it. Like, this is a problem in our field. Please help. Um, so that's, they they fundraised together in their little growers association and they, they gave us like, I don't remember how much it was. Let's say it was $500. <laughs> but then we say, to a bigger funder like the like OMAFRA, that's Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. It's the Ontario government agriculture people. And we say, hey, look, these growers, they really want us to do this research. They gave us $500. Can you give me more money? <laughs> and <laughs> does like, that oh, work? Growers, yeah, if the growers yeah. really want it, enough to give you $500. Here's twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm just. I don't know how the, the the money actually works exactly, like dollar sign amount. Um, but that's that's kind of how the story goes. So because and we I have this that, good. And sorry to interrupt, but I, I just love yeah. the fact that you have this relationship with directly with the growers, right? We usually think of like uh, science being separate from from the rest of the community or whatever. But the, it, this looks like you guys are really working hand in hand with the growers and kind of, you know, getting information flowing, I would assume, back and forth with them. I'm going to be a little bit selfish here because I'm actually originally from northern Ontario, so the Sudbury region, and, yeah. uh, you know, from a family of, of growers. So they were uh, in agriculture, my grandparents, both grandparents. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be selfish because, because I really want to know, does this uh, fungus also affect Northern Ontario? Yeah, it can actually be anywhere. Um, there was a suspicion that it, it came in from like Mexico on like, um, you know, transplants or something or, or other material or plant material. But honestly, this disease, this fungus has probably been here forever it's just not really been a problem um and yeah it can go all the way up to north it can definitely go up north um it can infect like 500 different plants uh yeah that's... so this is not just an onion problem no no it's not a big problem on a lot of crops but it is on it is a big problem on asparagus and it's a big problem on pear so what is the connection between asparagus pear and onion I don't know. I'm not a taxonomist. I need a botanist to figure that out. It just, it, it's a big problem in asparagus and pears because on, on pears, it causes little brown spots on the actual fruit and then no one's going to eat them. They look gross. And on asparagus, it causes little purple spots on the spears. And again, no one wants to eat that. And the crazy thing about asparagus is that you cannot spray fungicides on asparagus because you literally have to harvest it every single day. Like the amount, the, the, the eight inch asparagus that, that grew, like that was like overnight. They go out and cut it with a knife every single day for six, like four weeks. So you can't put, you can't spray fungicides on it because you need to cut it and put it on your plate. That's how fast it's going. Wow. Yeah, it is. It is very complicated. I mean, you know, my one of my aunts really pride had pride in the fact that she never used herbicides or any any kind of sides, put it that way, pesticides, herbicides, you, you, you name it. Um, 
but I, you know, I, I don't know how she managed to grow such beautiful crops. I wonder if it's just that farmers kind of get used to, you know, handling things their way, like picking up bugs, uh, you know, hand, you know, by hand or whatever. Um, so what, do, what can farmers do about this particular fungus right now? Are they just kind of, you know, meh, up in the air? Well, actually, um, yeah, there's there's not a lot to, that you can do. And I also argue that I don't think that for onions, like it can cause smaller onions, but I don't think it's that big of an issue. It hasn't been a big like epidemic, you know, killing all the leaves, 100% leaves infected. I've only, we've only seen that like twice in the past 10 years. So, so it's not it's not really big. It can come as an epidemic, but I think it's just kind of let it be. And and you said about your your um, aunt who's growing beautiful vegetables. I think when you're, I one of the terms we use in agriculture is intercropping, um, but that's that's using different crops in a small space. When you have many different crops in the same space, you actually often have lower disease pressure. Our monocropping of growing hundreds and hundreds of acres of the same crop that leads to just exponential increase of the pathogen because they've got lots of their favorite food around right it's the same okay. thing with you know recently in, in coronavirus with with COVID-19 where's the hot spots oh well there's more people right right there's more people there's more transmission there's more disease so in small garden plots or or intercropping it kind of acts as like a barrier it splits up the transmission even if you just grow like two crops intercropped between each other two like alternating rows that could decrease your disease i've read that it can also um affect the soil i've read that uh, farmers in big you know big farms in, in the united states that grow corn have to grow soy the following year or something like that is that is that what's going on is it a disease problem no with that corn is very bad for the soil it it is a very tall plant so it takes a lot of nutrients out of the soil and it doesn't really give anything back and one of the things that it really takes is nitrogen. Um, so we have a lot of nitrogen in the air that's not actually accessible. It has to be fixed nitrogen. And one way that nitrogen can get fixed is randomly through lightning strikes. And we know how often that happens. And, and by beneficial bacteria. So corn doesn't really have a root system that supports those beneficial bacteria. However, soybeans and any of the legume families, any of the beans, they actually produce a little home for the bacteria in their roots. They're called nodules. So it's like a, a root going along and then a little white bump and then a root and a white bump. And in each little white bump, that's where the bacteria, it's like, hey, I built you a home, please live here. And the bacteria live inside the plant, but then produce and fix nitrogen into a usable form for plants. So by growing soy, it actually puts more nitrogen back into the soil for the next crop. And that is so, Sarah, this is so amazing because I asked you that question expecting a very short answer. You gave me a very thorough, very easy to understand um, answer to that. And it just goes to show that you not only do you know a lot about onions and stuff, but I, I feel like you have such a wider knowledge for somebody who's doing a PhD, you know, like, I, I don't know if, if that sounds rude or, or whatever to other scientists, but you know what I mean? Like, um, sometimes I'll ask, you know, a scientist about uh, a fish that they're not studying. And they're like, oh, I don't know. I don't study that fish or whatever. But if, with you, it's like, oh, yes, well, corn does this and this. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm actually super, you know, impressed. Um, you have a TikTok video also where somebody asked you, I guess, about how plants behave. And you, you posted a really cool answer to that. One of the, the things in that answer that I wanted to touch base on is the micro network of fungi. I'm like, yeah. tell me more about that. What's going on here? So I actually heard about that, you know, back, back, back in, in the day and was like, oh, yeah, trees communicate with each other. And it was kind of ignored. And then I watched 
a video that was released, I guess it was released just last year, and I think it's like fantastic fungi, and I recommend that video. Really, really cool. One of the things they talked about is how trees communicate. And so there's a specific type of fungus, and it's called mycorrhizae. And that's just a big group of a type of fungus. Um, and it wants sugar. And who has sugar? Plants. Oh, great. That sounds good. Well, plants want water. Well, fungi <laughs> are mostly water. So they make a partnership. And so they help the plants. They actually extend the network of the roots to make each individual plant's roots longer, deeper, so they can gather more water and bring more nutrients to the plant. And the plant says, thank you very much. Here's some sugar. And they have a little exchange. But they've also found that, let's say, tree number one has mycorrhizae, and next door to it, tree number two also has mycorrhizae, because fungi are, can be so large, they can actually connect multiple trees together. The largest land organism on Earth is a fungus in a forest in Oregon. And they found this out by, they, they put wooden popsicle sticks all along the forest, and they let the fungus in the soil infest the popsicle sticks and they did a DNA test and they found the entire forest underground was the same fungus. Wow. So if a tree on the west end of the forest gets damaged by insects, a tree all the way on the east side of the forest, the information can travel through the roots, through the mycorrhizae, all the fungus that connects them, like a, a telephone wire, so that the tree on the east side is going to start to make defense compounds basically like prepare their defenses to fight off the insects before they're even there that's mind-blowing and so cool <laughs> i can totally yeah. see why you're you're into this stuff because i'm like i'm like looking at the time i'm like we only have 20 minutes left but i want to know more you know yeah there is a oh. there is a great book called um what a plant knows which is something mm -hmm. that i read uh, a while back and also i think the author wrote a book about trees as well I forget the name do you know the name no, I don't. No, okay. But anyways, I, I learned a little bit about that, how plants can actually communicate with each other as well, not just uh, through the, the fungi network, which is just really, really cool. Um, yeah. So my favorite thing is to say, you know, the smell of fresh cut grass is yeah. the grass screaming for help. <laughs> it's literally an airborne compound that says, ouch, I'm injured. And nearby plants can smell that, can sense that, and then produce, you know, sort of compounds that will like produce scabs, you know, like how we, you know, when we get cut, we'll produce a scab. So they will produce the compounds that can block cuts before they're even cut. Yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> because, because, you know, they're, they're yelling out, going out, and we're going like, ah, oh, this is a beautiful summer day, <laughs> freshly cut lawn. Uh, I, I would imagine as a plant scientist that you must be very much in favor of people creating kind of wild grown lawns, right? Uh, for pollinators and all that stuff. Uh, do you, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I am now the uh, communication coordinator for the Guelph Turfgrass Institute. So I know that there are some people who are very passionate about grass and about their lawns. And they have to be this color of green. They have to be this length. And if you just want grass and you just want green space, that's great. Because green space is cooler temperature-wise than pavement. So if you want to grow a lawn, great, do it. I'm very happy for you. If you want to create spaces for pollinators, great, do it. I'm happy for you. Either is good, but I, I am cognizant of, of pollinators and, and there are many different types of pollinators. There's bees, there's flies, there's hummingbirds. So whatever you can do in your own space that you're comfortable with and you're able to maintain, do it. I'm so, and totally in support of you. Can everyone hang a um, hummingbird feeder in their backyard? No, probably not. Can everyone grow um, a huge garden full of pollinator plants? No, and that's okay too, because it you have to kind of decide what you can personally do and maintain, and and that's good. You know, don't go out and plant a bunch of um, 
pollinator friendly plants and then not water them. That, that doesn't make sense. If you're not going to water them, just, just grow grass, you know, grass can survive <laughs> so with that. So just figure out what works for you and, and do that. I, I'm not going to force everyone to be, you know, you must plant this and you must plant that. And you've got to keep the dandelions. You want to keep the dandelions? Awesome. You don't want the dandelions? That's okay too. <laughs> It's a very fair ass- assessment, and I really like the the fact that you re- reinforce the fact that green is cooler than the pavement. You know, you 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 know that just going outside in a parking lot versus going outside on a freshly cut lawn. I mean, you can just tell. Yeah. Um, question about lawns. One of the things I noticed when I visited Europe in 2014, I think, is that the grass is very short. I mean, there are rolling hills of grass and it's not like this monstrosity, not monstrosity, but you know what I mean? Like it's not like this super deep tick laden grass that we have to worry about here. They have this like short grass that nobody's cutting. Mm -hmm. Is it just a different species? Well, you know, the game of golf Think about where that originated from, right? That came from like Scotland, Ireland, England kind of area. I'm not an expert. I don't exactly know where the sport was born. But the sport was born because they had that kind of field naturally. They're like, hey, look at this nice area. What if I had a ball and I, you know, kicked it around and got it into a rabbit hole? That's naturally occurring space. That's just how that ecosystem works. Grassland is a large part of that ecosystem and we can grow it here. And and there's also uh, areas of New Zealand that look very much like that, you know, you know, where they filmed Lord of the Rings and, and yeah, you, you know, um, those grasslands are, are not maintained. You know, sometimes they might be maintained by, you know, sheep or, or cows or whatever, you know, animal that eats that sort of plant that's just a natural ecosystem and the long grass that we have here, that's also a natural ecosystem. Both of them are okay, but they, they favor different animals, you know? Um, And it depends on on what they have, you know, England doesn't have bears and they they don't have mountain lions. So a long field, like tall field of grass is great for a mountain lion or cougar as we might call them, but they don't have those. So the plants and the animals, the ecosystems, they developed together. You know, so if there's not something in another area, it's because of a relationship between all of the things involved. The ecosystem is as an ongoing relationship. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I I mean, that's what I figured, Uh, you know, you're overseas. So of course, the grass is going to be different, Julie, you know. (laughs) Uh, One of the videos I really like about uh, th- that you did on TikTok is about boring science. And the reason I like it is because it really reinforced the fact that, uh, uh, well, it also explained why I didn't become a scientist because I'm so easily bored. But also, it really reinforced the fact that, like you said, science is repeatable, it is measurable, and it is boring for that reason. And it's something to be embraced. It's not necessarily something that we need to look down on. Uh, so, did, were you were you getting flack from that? Is it just something that you were passionate about? Is that why you decided to talk about that? I was getting really frustrated with a lot of people saying that the COVID vaccine was unsafe, that it was developed too quickly, that there was turning you into a magnet or GPS unit or something. You know, I don't trust scientists. I don't trust those big chemical companies. That's what I was getting really frustrated with, especially in the news. Um, and so I wrote that, you know, maybe our vaccine was sped up faster than other vaccines have been in the past, but thats it's not like they just pulled it out of nowhere. We've been developing vaccines for decades and it is a very boring process. And that's why it's safe because we do it all the time. It's not just someone that ran down into their backyard or <laughs> into their basement, um, mad science laboratory and put some chemicals together and exploded and I can save the world or ruin the world. That's not what it is. I do do a lot of, you know, wow science. And that's like the, you know, here's a chemical change. Here's an explosion. Like those are the things that like get your attention. But then when you love science, that's when you go into the lab and pipette. So a pipette is just like, it picks up small amounts of liquid and, and, and moves it. And that's just like 
It's almost like clicking a pen up and down, up and down, up and down, hours, up and down, up and down. And that's what you got to do. You're going to be pipetting for hours. You're going to be measuring leaves for hours. You're going to be sifting soil for hours. You know, it's boring <laughs> and you need to love it to do it because you need to do it the boring way all the time because you're going to have to do your experiments multiple times. Someone else is going to have to redo your experiments. That is how science is born. We never actually prove anything. We just say that things are less likely, you know, like, oh, I tried this this many times. It didn't happen. Or what was what the bad thing I was expecting didn't happen. So I didn't prove the bad thing can never happen. I just proved that it's less likely to happen. And even when they were saying, you know, the, the, the COVID vaccine was causing blood clots, the one type, you know, when you say how many percentage it was causing blood clots in, no one thinks about the fact that birth control causes blood clots and they never blink an eye at that. I was on birth control for over 10 years of my life and I never knew that I was at risk for blood clots because no one ever right. told me because they're just like, yeah, this is not having a baby is more important than you having a blood clot. And so now people are saying, oh, dying. I'd rather die than die of COVID or then get a blood clot. So I'm like, what? So how do you then, I mean, how do you, as somebody who, like you said, you know, um, I, I, I would imagine you also get bored, though. I mean, th like you said, it is science is a, a, a profession that encompasses and embraces boredom for that reason, to, because it is something that is evidence based and all that stuff. But let's say day to day, how do you deal with it when you're like, oh, God, I have to do this again? You know, how do you deal with that? I, if I'm doing a lot of repetitive tasks, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I really like true, true crime podcasts. I don't know why that's just fascinating to me. I can kind of shut my brain off and just do the automatic tasks. Um, I listen to music. Um, and I don't know, I get excited when I know that I'm going to be able to collect data because when I actually get the numbers at the end of the day, and then I can go put them into my statistics program and get the result. That's what, that's what drives me. Um, so yeah, I know there, there's lots of boring things in between. One of the boringest thing was having to drive an hour and a half every day to get to my field. That was boring. <laughs> Why but, did you have to drive that far? Because the muck soil only occurs in certain areas. So mm -hmm. I don't live near them. And so I had to drive there. <laughs> Can't move the field to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. Um <laughs> So, okay. So yeah, I guess it sounds like, you know, in, in deep inside your head that it's leading to something. It's kind of like farming in Minecraft. You kind of know that eventually, you know, you're going to get some iron and eventually you're going to be able to build a, uh, you know, armor. Um, but that takes time. It is time. exactly that. It's looking for <laughs> diamonds in Minecraft. That's, that's the, Yeah. You just Are you a gamer? Going tick, tick. I have definitely played Minecraft. I used to play World of Warcraft. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Nowadays, I'm more Animal Crossing. That's my, you know, little getaway into my island of friends that are cute little animals. So I enjoy that a lot. <laughs> That's my 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 kind of upcoming guilty purchase. I think is going to be to get one of those um, Nintendo. What do they call them again? Nintendo the Switch. The Switch. Oh my God, I'm yeah. having a brain fart. Uh, but yes, the Switch is the thing that I haven't been able to justify to myself to buy, but I really want to play Animal Crossing. Uh, so you, yeah, no. You can I mean. play it on the DS. I have it on the DS still. I got it from no. like 10 years oh, ago. The, the, yeah, it's fun. I don't have There's anything it. Nintendo. Oh, man, <laughs> yeah, I, know. I played Animal Crossing <laughs> back when it was on the GameCube, okay? <laughs> like... <laughs> No, no, sorry, that was Harvest Moon. Very similar game. But um Right. I I I've been an Animal Crosser for for a long time. Let's just say that. Why don't you do Twitch? I never got into it. You know, um I that was one of the things I don't feel like I could talk that long on my own without someone else. You know, you're you're guiding my my speaking here by asking me questions. If I were to just talk alone I would run out of things to say I think 
It's funny because I, uh, I've i recruited, let's say, a ton of scientists to Twitch because that's what I was doing last year. I was on Twitch. I, I was doing a microscope stream. So, and I've always found it super weird. And one of the reasons why I've kind of, I don't want to say abandoned, but paused Twitch is because, like you said, this feedback is a lot more fun. Uh, you know, when you're talking to someone and getting to know them and talking about, you know, science stuff and non-science stuff. And speaking of the non-science stuff, what do you do? So now we've learned that you're a gamer, but what do you do outside of gaming and, and science um, and taking care of probably a bazillion houseplants, I would imagine? <laughs> what do you do Honestly, for fun? <laughs> as a plant pathologist, I kill plants. I actually only have one houseplant right now, and it is just barely hanging on. Um, How is that possible? Because I only keep plants alive long enough to put fungus on them and kill them. <laughs> That's what I do. Um, no, I I actually really do like gardening. I have garden outside. And, and like you said, uh, with pollinators, I've been trying to plant um, plants that are native to North America, like uh, foxglove or delphinium, things that pollinators are going to enjoy. Um, and you got to think about different types of pollinators. So like these ones are really good for bees, but there's like there's lots of different types of bees. So I've been learning a lot about that. Honestly, all of my hobbies are science. Everything is science in my world. Um, I also like puzzles. Um, I, I do woodworking and wood burning. So I'm a bit of an artiste. <laughs> Ooh, that yeah. really interests me because that I think is going to be the next thing I'm going to, I'm going to get into is woodworking. Uh, what yeah. are you making? So I've previously worked with a friend of mine. He built a bunch of bird houses and then I would design, you know, I would draw birds on them with a burning pen. Um, just recently, I helped my my partner do a project. My partner's a teacher and they were doing an art project. So they needed a bunch of wood to make nail art. So I cut out 50 pieces of wood and sanded them all for them. You know, I just, I tinker. I like to build, you know, the odd shelf. I built a, a nail polish shelf for my friends because she was complaining that the brand she got, the shelf was too tight. It couldn't fit them in, the one type of nail polish. So I got the nail polish and I, I built a shelf for her, you know. My my dad was, uh, had a machine shop in the backyard. And so he always kind of taught me all the different tools. And he said that I can make something out of anything, you know. And I've, I'm, I don't want to say I'm a, a hoarder, but I always keep things. I'm like, oh, I can make that into something. And so I'm always tinkering and making things. It sounds to me like your dad, uh, I mean, I'm assuming you're probably almost the same age as me. Are you like almost, are you like 40-ish, let's say? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a 90 baby, so I'm 31 this year. 31. Okay. Well, the, the, the only reason I said that, though, is because you knew some of the pop culture references that I said so <laughs> yeah and um but it sounds like your dad really kind of treated you like somebody who wasn't limited by the fact that you were a girl you know like it, my dad was the same way he'd be give me a hammer he'd be like go do this you know and and none of the other girls were like playing with hammers and tools yeah my dad was pretty cool in that way he had two daughters and I think he always kind of wanted a son but he kind of made do and he was like well hey, just come along like um he was he was working at home and my mom was working in a factory. So he was like the babysitter essentially. And so we were just around when he was doing stuff. And he's like, yeah, sure. Help out. So I, I worked on a lathe. I, I had, a, I worked on a drill press and a bandsaw and a, all these things before I was even in high school. I, I was building things. I, I learned how to whittle. I, it just, we had a very, very hands-on lack of technology childhood we had really bad internet honestly <laughs> I think that was kind of structural in one family computer and the dial-up internet so you know yeah when I got the roller coaster tycoon cd yeah. out of the cereal box that was groundbreaking for me <laughs> yeah if you grew up in the 90s you were really at the beginning of, of the internet age you know like that was like the thing uh, where did you grow up um, actually, central, north central uh, Ontario, so just a little bit north of Barrie. Yeah, so in a small town, very secluded. There's not, we were like on the very edge of a very small town. There wasn't even a sidewalk to my house. 
Wow. Okay. So kind of similar upbringing to me as well then. So you kind of definitely can relate to that. Sarah, yeah. what's next? What's next for you? I mean, let's say, let's just assume that you, you get your PhD. Um, you know, you already have that job, like you said, in communications. What's the like 10 year plan? What's the thing that you kind of like would dream to be doing? Well, I really want to be able to keep teaching and doing outreach and extension. So it could be something along the lines of like taking research and communicating it to homeowners or the general public or growers, farmers, that kind of thing. I would really love doing that. I would love to teach at the university. Having a PhD in my back pocket allows me to apply for teaching positions at the university. And I've, I've like I said, I've taught at the university and I've also been a teaching assistant. And uh, some of the professors I've worked with have said, you know, you're more qualified to teach this than I am because I have they don't hire professors based on teaching qualifications. They hire them based on research qualifications. And I think that is starting to change. They're starting to recognize that just because you're a good researcher doesn't necessarily mean you're a good teacher. So I would love someday to be a teacher at the in a university. Um, so that's that's the 10, 10 year plan, but I also want to adopt a house full of kids and animals and and have a family. So that's why I don't, I'm not currently chasing the act, the faculty position because in order for me to do that, I have to like travel around the world, find, you know, one year jobs here and there and there and, and rack up a bunch of publications and, and play the academic. There's like a game behind it. There's, you know, who you know and what you know and how many publications you have. And I don't, I don't really want to do that right now. So that the professor is like, 10 years down the line, I'm going to have this job here at the university for the next few years. I'm going to still try to do some research while I'm doing that, still try to do some publications, but at a slower pace and, you know, focus on things that I enjoy to do. You know, I love being around kids. I love having animals. I look at the animal shelter uh, website, like on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> I do that too. Sometimes I'll spend like a whole Saturday and then I won't look at it again for another month or so. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a thing. Yeah. Like, Oh, this one only has three legs. I need to get it. <laughs> uh, listen, so. Sarah, we're, we're out of time. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. I really do wish that we had the video component because you're very, uh, you're such a very, you have a presence and it's very engaging. And so um, I, I really would encourage people to go to your TikTok. Uh, Science Sarah, and uh, to keep in mind uh, that you are taking a bit of a break to to defend your thesis. And um, I hope you'll come in the program again, because I would love to talk with you again and follow up and, you know, just learn more about what you're doing. So thanks again for coming on the program. Thanks for inviting me. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm.